History as it happens, June 24th, 2021. The liberal roots of the Republican Party. We need to completely dismantle the Minneapolis Police Department. I guess you can use a snappy slogan like defund the police, but you know you've lost a big audience the minute you say it. In the 1850s, the new Republicans fused a left-wing social movement with electoral politics. The movement to end slavery went from the margins to the mainstream. Today, leftists are fighting for their causes with limited success. So can the abolitionists of the past show them the way forward? That's next, as we report History As It Happens, a podcast from The Washington Times. I'm Martin DeCaro. But through the grassroots activism of millions of Americans who are standing up and fighting back, who are becoming more engaged politically. And when we all stand together, we're going to be able to take on the insurance companies and the drug companies and Wall Street and everybody else. If your political vision, however noble and just and and sort of egalitarian in aspiration, is not capable of speaking also in material terms to the immediate and embodied self-interest of a majority in democratic politics, you're going to struggle. There's a great line in the movie Amadeus from 1984. Mozart is trying to convince the Austrian emperor to let him put on a production of The Marriage of Figaro. Bello, 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 come on now, be honest. Which one of you wouldn't rather listen to his hairdresser than Hercules? Or Horatius, or Orpheus, people so lofty they sound as if they marble. What? Your tongue, Mozart, how dare you? Forgive me, Majesty. I'm a vulgar man. But I assure you, my music is not. And the Emperor responds, You know, Mozart, you are passionate. But you do not persuade. So why don't we apply this to social activism in politics, being passionate but maybe not persuasive. Reminds me of a scene in Minneapolis last summer when the mayor of that city was booed by protesters because he wouldn't say he'd be willing to abolish his police department. So let's go back about 170 years or so. You may be morally in the right, and your opponents could be morally in the wrong, but how are you going to persuade, say, northern voters and politicians that slavery has to be placed on the course of ultimate extinction, as Lincoln put it in 1858? The Republicans of the 1850s were, to borrow a modern term, the liberals of their time. The new party was made up of a slew of former Whigs, disaffected Democrats, free soilers looking for a new home, know-nothings, and others during a tumultuous time in U.S. politics. In 1854, the Kansas-Nebraska Act repealed the Missouri Compromise and once again placed slavery at the forefront. It was an issue that many people would have preferred to leave alone. And this new party had its platform, and its most important plank was to fight the expansion of slavery with the aim of eventually ending its existence, as our guest today will argue. And this was no easy argument. The radical abolitionists were considered dangerous fanatics, and some anti-slavery men were accused of being too moderate, too cautious in the face of implacable hostility on the part of the southern slave power. Yet this new Republican Party, the first anti-slavery party in American history, achieved power. So what can this story teach us about the current moment, a time when liberals or progressives or democratic socialists like Bernie Sanders are calling for sweeping changes to the American system, from taxes to health care to policing, any number of racial or economic issues? So let's talk about it now with Princeton historian Matthew Karp. He is the author of This Vast Southern Empire, Slaveholders at the Helm of American Foreign Policy. And he's now working on a book about the emergence of anti-slavery mass politics in the United States. Matthew Karp, welcome. Hi, happy to be here. So let's begin by talking about the different constituencies and parties that came together to form the Republican Party, which, as you have noted, became the largest political force in the entire North by 1856. 
So we have anti-slavery activists and politicians. Who else? And when did this start to occur? Yeah, I mean, the story of the rise of the Republican Party is the story really of the meltdown of the second party system, which had basically gripped American politics from the presidency of Andrew Jackson a generation earlier, beginning in the 1820s through to the 1850s. That system consisted of a lot of fiercely contested battles on economic and cultural issues between Democrats and Whigs were the two largest parties, although there were a number of smaller parties that bubbled up and bubbled down in that period too. And anti-slavery parties had been on the extreme margins of, you know, at least electorally speaking, of that conflict. The Liberty Party, which is the first specifically anti-slavery electoral party formed in the U.S., got less than 1% of the vote in the first election it contested in 1840. And even by the 1850s, it was still polling under 5% in the election of 1852. So when that party system melted down, and we can talk about the causes of that, but to answer your question, the Republicans emerged from the ashes of the Whig Party principally, which really was wrecked after the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854 and was unable to sort of reconstitute itself as a national party. And so a lot of Northern Whigs joined the Republican Party. Historians estimated something like Two thirds to three quarters of the party's politicians emerged from the Whig Party in one way or another. But numbers weren't everything because the sort of ideological core of the party, I think, came from this small third party tradition. Figures like Salmon Chase and Joshua Giddings, you know, anti-slavery radicals who'd been in the Liberty or the Free Soil parties seized the reins. And then the final element is the disaffected anti-slavery Northern Democrats who comprised a significant part of the party after 1854 and by 1856. The Whigs broke up because of the slavery issue. Right. Yes, exactly. In effect, after you know Congress passed and Franklin Pierce signed a bill extending slavery or the possibility of slavery into Kansas and Nebraska territories and to broadly, potentially at least, the entire West, overturning the Missouri Compromise, you know, the settlement that had kept slavery on the margins of national politics is a quasi consensus between northern and southern wings of both Democrat and Whig parties. Slavery leapt back into the forefront of politics. I mean, I'm simplifying a lot of the complex history because it had also come up in the 1840s in a significant way, but leapt back into politics and northern Whigs and southern Whigs split irreparably over Kansas, Nebraska, to the point where a national Whig party could no longer exist. Although uh, maybe this is too into the weeds, but the idea that the Whig party would be replaced by a broadly anti-slavery party was by no means written in the stars in 1854. There were many alternate destinies and many alternate forces in American politics that A, potentially wanted to keep the national Whig party together, potentially wanted to replace the Whig party with a kind of conservative unionist party in the North or to replace the Whig Party with an anti-immigrant nativist party in the North. There were all sorts of competing political tendencies in the chaos of the mid-1850s, and it was a contingent event that the anti-slavery Republican Party emerged victorious. The know-nothings opposed slavery, but their priority was nativism and keeping Catholic immigrants out of the country, correct? In the aftermath of Kansas-Nebraska, they surged to victory in in some northeastern states, principally Massachusetts, kind of combining anti-slavery and anti-immigrant sentiment. But in effect, they were through a complicated series of maneuvers. They were sort of outflanked and in some cases just outright defeated by anti-slavery mobilization. And, you know, frankly, another big element of it is that their effort was to try to forge a national party. And when they got together in convention, Even anti-immigrant sentiment was not strong enough to hold the party together when the slavery issue came up because the northern and southern wings did not agree. So by 1856, the American party, the Know Nothing Party, was largely a southern dominated party. It was the sort of the remnants of the southern Whigs. And only in a few northern states did they really account for much. Well, as you just explained, and as your colleague at Princeton, Sean Wilentz, has written, The Republican Party was a ragtag coalition. Uh, You mentioned some of these constituencies, former reformist Whigs, former reformist Democrats, immigrants, especially Germans and nativists, old Liberty Party egalitarians, old barn burner, capital B, and Midwestern racists, but not radical abolitionists, not the immediatists. I love Lincoln's line on this, Uh, you know, out of strange, discordant, even hostile elements gathered from the four winds, you know, the Republican Party came together. It was not something, uh, a set of alliances that anyone would have looked to to be the dominant political force in the North just a handful of years before. 
But I guess I would qualify to some extent the way that you gloss that there in terms of the role of radical abolitionists. I think it's true that it did not include a specific strand of abolitionism that has been historically influential that historians have written a lot about. That is the Garrisonian anti-electoral radicals who based largely in the Northeast who disdained electoral politics, considered the Constitution a covenant with hell and an agreement with death, and rejected participating in elections under that Constitution. But I would say by the 1850s, that is a minority of even the group called radical abolitionists, because the radical abolitionists in the Northwest, and frankly, even in even in New York State, outside of New England, had been drifting or in some cases leaping into electoral politics for a long time. And that includes people like Frederick Douglass, who broke from Garrison to support third party radical anti-slavery candidates as early as the 1850s and who had ambivalence about the Republican Party when it formed, but ultimately in 1856 came around and endorsed the party. So moving down the political spectrum from somebody like Douglass, who is in some ways in the 1850s as radical as, as you could come on the subject of slavery, you had other radical abolitionists like Giddings or Chase, who had never really been integrated into, I mean, Giddings was an anti-slavery Whig for at least some portion of his career, but you had people who'd really devoted their lives to breaking up the second party system on the basis of slavery. I consider that group to be radical in terms of its the impact that it had on the political system. It shook the system to its root. It was not anti-electoral, though. It believed in contesting elections, in winning an anti-slavery majority. So in that sense, it was very different from the Garrisonian approach. You started to answer my next question. I was <laughs> going to ask, uh, what do we mean when we say an anti-slavery politics, an anti-slavery Republican Party by the mid-1850s. You just mentioned the Garrisonian abolitionists rejected politics. So was the majority view within this new Republican Party about hemming slavery in, containing it where it existed, not allowing it to spread? Or were they talking about amending the Constitution to get rid of slavery once and for all? Yeah, it's a good question. And it's a complicated one because, again, there were in the third parties that preceded the Republican Party and in the Republican Party itself, there were different tendencies, different political programs and different rhetorics that tackled that question. By the time we get to the Republicans on the the conservative end of the party, including some former Whigs and some former Democrats, the minimum demand was the non-extension of slavery into the West. And that was, if you will, the floor of all Republican Party political effort, which I would point out, by the way, is sometimes depicted as a really limited, cautious, unradical demand. And certainly that's how Frederick Douglass saw it. That's how William Lloyd Garrison would have seen it for sure. But in the context of American politics in the 1840s, it was not seen, certainly in the context of how slaveholders viewed it, or even how unionist Democrats or unionist Whigs viewed it, it was not a moderate demand. It meant the absolute quarantine and containment of slavery in the South, which from the perspective of many both anti- and pro-slavery people would guarantee the ultimate demise of the institution. And many Republicans, including Lincoln, were explicit on this point. And it was not to contain it to let it exist in perpetuity, but it was to contain it in order to do what was basically the most anti-slavery action we can take under the Constitution, which is to sort of isolate it, cripple it. But I would say also on top of that, within the party, there were a number of other tendencies and sort of programmatic approaches that also wanted to either annul or reform the Fugitive Slave Act that toyed with the idea of, at least rhetorically, with using powers granted to Congress under interstate commerce laws to regulate the uh, internal slave trade. None of these things really ended up coming to fruition because we didn't really have a sense of what Republican rule in peacetime would look like. The South seceded and we only had a wartime Republican Party in power. So we don't really know which of these tendencies would have proven stronger and how that work would have gone. But Count me in the camp of someone who doesn't see that this Republican program as, in the context of the 1850s, as a moderate one. And we can talk about why I think that. I think there are reasons for that that go beyond the elements in the program. It has a lot to do with the way they talked about slavery and the way that they summoned a mass politics that was hostile to slavery. You know, William Seward has a great line about how, in effect, that what's most important, what defines a party is not its program, but in a sense, the spirit that it calls out of the people. And the Republican Party called fundamentally 
an anti-slavery spirit from the masses. And you see the best litmus test for this is in the declarations of secession on the South. Georgia says, we don't secede because simply because Lincoln has occupied the White House. We secede because he has captured the whole mind of the North in an anti-slavery spirit. That's not to say that they're identical to the ultra-radicals either, but I think it's important to get that nuance right. So let's dig a little deeper into that nuance then, because from the Southern perspective, any policy that would lay a finger on slavery was radical. But to become an effective political party in the North, moving from activism to effective politics, the new Republicans, they had to craft their message in a way that didn't sound like they were going to be on on the Garrisonian end of things, right? But forceful enough to make plain where they were going. No, absolutely. It was an art and not a science. And there were different approaches in in different districts. You know, I mean, famously in the Lincoln-Douglas debate, Stephen Douglas, I think not incorrectly, not inaccurately, accused Lincoln of having different opinions in different latitudes, where in the northern part of the state, which was full of very strong, if not red-hot political abolitionists from greater New England and the the Great Lakes region, Lincoln leaned into his course of ultimate extinction arguments and his moral critique of slavery, which was heartfelt and which he never abandoned, even in the southern part of the state, but in that contestable region of central Illinois or in southern Illinois, populated much more heavily by migrants from the middle states and really from the upper south, uh, Republicans did work to reassure anxious voters that they were not, I think principally the way they did this is they made clear that they were not a party of disunion. This was the biggest and I think the most damning charge that Democrats laid at Republican feet. I mean, there were two main attacks on Republican radicalism. One was on racial grounds, you know, that they were the party of black rights, and two, that they were the party of disunion. And the the first campaign was was lodged with the most vitriolic racial appeals to white supremacy that were very candid in the Democratic Party at the time. And Republicans were often on the defensive there. They did not campaign on black suffrage, for instance. Although, to nuance even that, when Northern states held suffrage referenda, Republican leaders generally shied away from supporting those. But Republican voters, by and large, supported black suffrage rights. But but on the disunion question, because I think that in, in some ways, some historians have argued that was actually the most damaging critique of Republicans, that electing this party will provoke disunion because of Southern threats. And this is what Democrats said over and over again. And Republicans walked a fine line here because what they said was, They did not back down on either the essence of their program, which was the containment of slavery, or the essence of their politics, which was the demonization of slavery, the reduction of all political debate in some cases, what could be a very complicated and even technical legalistic debate about the status, the constitutional status of slavery in the territories. They often on the campaign trail reduced it to a kind of, are you for slavery or are you for freedom? Which I would argue has a radicalizing impulse, not a moderating impulse, because it summons a spirit of the people that says, no, I'm not for slavery, I'm for freedom. And the technical details of that can get lost. This is what slaveholders were reacting to. At the same time, unlike the Garrisonians, they made it clear that they stood for union. In effect, what they were trying to do was redefine the union from as being sort of default identified with slavery and the indefinite preservation, even expansion of slavery, to in effect an anti-slavery union. And they used a very, lots of candid majoritarian, I would say even populist appeals to make this point. You know, William Seward talked about, you know, that slaveholders represent only one hundredth part of the population, 300,000 slaveholders for about three million people. And this was an appeal to the, if you will, the northern 99 percent of even to some extent the non-slaveholding southern 99 percent who were not invested directly in slave property and could reclaim the union, the whole union, not just the north or not, not any kind of separatism in the way that Garrison called for northern secession, et cetera, but to reclaim the whole union as fundamentally an anti-slavery union. And this is where their appeals to the founders were so important. Basically, they were arguing that democracy and slavery were incompatible, not this idea that white democracy rests on black slavery. Yes, I think that's well put. And I think that was certainly... Well, I read um, your essay that you sent me prior to our conversation, so I hope I'm getting it right. Yeah, no, I think that was a core element of Republican politics. And I think 
to some extent, I think historians haven't really highlighted that in the way that they could, because certainly it's true in, say, colonial Virginia. This is Edmund Morgan's famous thesis about how, to some extent, elements of democratization for whites happened in twain and maybe to some extent concomitant with, inextricable from, the constriction of rights for Black people and, and the solidification of slavery. That's true in some specific times and places historically. And yet, in this moment, it was the reverse. Republicans made the case. The weakness of slavery was not that it could not exist in the market capitalism of the 19th century. I mean, they critiqued its inefficiency economically and so on, for sure, uh, in comparison to northern free labor. But the fundamental weakness of slavery, in my view, was not that it was totally incompatible with mid-19th century capitalism. It proved statistically highly compatible, at least from the profit-making perspective of, of the slaveholder. Its weakness was its limited and counter-majoritarian place in a majoritarian democracy, which for all the checks and balances in the Constitution ultimately proved fatal to it. And Republicans seized on this and said, why should this tiny tiny, tiny minority, which they deemed the slave power, be drawing on kind of old populist critique of the money power in the Jacksonian period, transferring that to the slave power. Why should this tiny group of aristocratic overlords and brutal exploiters and oppressors of black labor, why should they be set atop the entire political system of the country, rule the U.S. Senate, rule the White House through their coalition with the Democrats, with their doe face allies, and sort of set the terms of American political economy, whether it comes down to homesteads in the West or tariff policy in the Northeast, or whether it comes down to the future of slavery across the continent. Why should this tiny minority undemocratically rule? And so the Republican appeal was really based on a fundamental majoritarianism. So what happens between 1852 and 1856? Two national elections there. Activism, anti-slavery activism, becomes an effective anti-slavery politics. The Republican Party is now the political force in the northern states. It's a question that has relevance today. We're seeing all different kinds of activism today that aren't necessarily effective politically. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a we got into this a little bit in terms of the historical events at the beginning of the conversation, because the chief thing, the world breaking event was this Kansas, Nebraska Act. The anti-slavery revolution was sparked by, if you will, a pro-slavery overreach. This and the reaction it provoked in the North really destabilized the political system in 1854. Now, as I was sort of saying earlier, this still remained, though, a fluid moment where you had lots of people in the North saying, OK, yeah, this is horrible. What the Democrats are doing is an assault on the Missouri Compromise. It's an assault on the sacred pledge that has kept the peace in the Union. But what we need in response is no more than a reinstallation of the Missouri Compromise, which, if you remember, drew a line through the West, giving free labor above and slave labor below. There's no reason if you're on the ground in, say, March 1854, that this couldn't have been the basis of northern politics, something like restore the Missouri Compromise no further. But what the Republicans managed to do over the next year and a half is fight off those, I think, genuinely moderate or, if anything, to some extent, conservative elements within the broad post-Whig coalition, fight off nativists who wanted to turn the center of political gravity to the question of immigration and ethnocultural identity. And Republicans were able, I think, and I'm still actually, frankly, in the midst of doing a lot of historical research about 54, 55, 56, at the state level, especially in the upper north, Republicans are able to seize the momentum in that moment and say, no, what we need, you know, you see this in a very famous propaganda document that they released in January 54 after Kansas, Nebraska, called An Appeal to Independent Democrats, which was basically written by Salmon Chase and Joshua Giddings, a few others. And what they say is we need to cease this endless politics of compromise in which the pro-slavery forces will always either emerge victorious or break at their leisure. So what we need actually is to draw a line and contain slavery for good. And the fusion of that kind of constitutional doctrine, which they argued was consonant with the Constitution to deny slavery in the territories and refuse the admission of new slave territories and the expansion of slavery anywhere, with this sort of populist politics against the slave power, proved victorious in the field of a series of northern elections at the state level in 54, 55, and 56. And this proved that this kind of uh, muscular anti-slavery politics, which was both in some ways constitutionally restrained or organized and yet politically highly aggressive, could prove victorious. 
Well, for the first time in American history, a political party was trying to end slavery, not simply reach an accommodation with it. So as the slavery issue continued to, well, become more of an issue, it forces the players in this story to come down on one side or the other. And as this sort of this orientation within the Republican Party grows, and I think fall of 55, William Seward, who I mentioned earlier, is probably the most influential antebellum Republican and himself also, at least in this stage of his career, quite radical rhetorically and sincerely committed to ending slavery for good, not simply containing it. If you read his correspondence, it's, it's quite clear that he, like Chase, sees containment as a strategy for ultimate emancipation. Seward joins, loudly joins the Republican Party in 56, and very explicitly, they see their appeal within mass politics, within summoning what they viewed was, in effect, a sleeping northern majority. The issue is not actually that they had to change two million northern minds from supporting slavery to opposing slavery. What they had to do, in effect, was activate a kind of slumbering northern majority that already didn't like slavery, but saw it as an inevitable part of the political system and maybe worse than the evil of disunion. And Republicans had to sort of convince, summon that majority and convince it that slavery, in fact, was the greater danger to their democratic rights. And that theory of the slumbering majority is a a powerful one. And how to activate that, how to not necessarily change hearts and minds, but to activate the hearts and minds that are in some ways passively already committed to a political project is a powerful strategy for, I think, radical politics. The point here was to use democratic smaldy, democratic politics to end slavery. You mentioned before, we don't know how the story would have turned out because secession and war intervened. But the idea here wasn't to keep anti-slavery activism or abolitionism on the margins anymore. It was to use politics to get rid of slavery or at least contain slavery. Contain slavery, but contain it as a means to end it. And I should say that in to some extent, James Oakes has made this point very powerfully, but there's even more evidence than he's dug up. They didn't see secession and war as something entirely outside the realm of possibility. I don't think they foresaw what would happen, but they were very explicit. Stewart, more than almost anyone, the most influential Republican, more than almost anyone, You know, there are two ways for slavery to go out, in effect. You can either accede to, in effect, the democratic revolution of emancipation through slow and peaceful measures, or if the South secedes to defend slavery, it will go out in blood. And a number of Republicans across the 1850s make that point very clear. I mean, and this is what made secession both a risk, but also, from a pro-slavery point of view, a rational decision, I think, because they knew that these northern politicians, almost more importantly, that the masses that they had summoned behind them had an implacable hostility to slavery's ongoing existence. One radical abolitionist we haven't mentioned yet who understood that it would take violence to end slavery was John Brown. Of course, he was far outside the political system. He was interested in making war sooner rather than later. And I guess I'm bringing him up because Southerners could point to him and say, look, look at what those abolitionists in the North have in mind. No, that's true. And this is a complicated situation for Republicans because many of them violently disagreed with John Brown and certainly disclaimed any connection with John Brown when, you know, after the Harper's Ferry raid, Republicans made a big hue and cry about we need to investigate connections between the Republican Party and, you know, this terrorist in effect. And they all gave their we had nothing to do with John Brown. John Brown is not our politics. And yet what was striking, I mean, if you read Lincoln's Cooper Union speech, you know, which is seen as actually one of his sort of more moderate or even conservative speeches where he ties the Republican platform to the political worldview of the founding generation. He tries to make the case that the men who signed the Constitution were all deeply anti-slavery and he's merely fulfilling their project. And so is the Republican Party, which historians can argue about, you know, in my view, he overstates the case, the degree to which the founders were aggressively anti-slavery. But even within that speech, it's, it's made in New York in 1860, right after John Brown's raid. And he tackles John Brown and he, you know, he denounces John Brown and, and distances himself from John Brown. But even he, he does this move that Republicans all do, which is in effect to blame John Brown, not on the abolitionists, but on the slaveholders, on slavery itself, to say that this is a system that Lincoln has a line there about, you know, the occasional murder and poisoning is to be expected. 
in a system like this. You know, the occasional violent reaction, and Chase goes further, more explicitly says the fault is the system itself. Slavery itself for, for Lincoln and for the Republicans is the source of the evil of slave expansion, is the source of the evil of the slave powers on democratic rule. The problem comes down to slavery itself, which is a moral crime, a sin for the many Americans who were who had deep religious feeling about it, and a political evil, a cancer. The sum of all villainies was a sort of a standard phrase in the time. So John Brown, even for all of his excesses and his violence, he himself was a product of the villainy of slavery itself. And, and Southerners heard this. They, they didn't miss these cues. And so while reading their speeches today, we might say, wait a minute, they're completely blurring the line between somebody like Lincoln and John Brown, and they really avoid important distinctions. Fair enough. But what they see within Lincoln is some of the same sort of remorseless hatred of slavery itself, and that that hatred is spreading not just to a kind of an activist class, but to the, the northern population writ large. So in that sense, the Republican Party was the liberal party of its day, built on social activism or the movement to end slavery and turning that into effective politics. On the left today, let's just take the Black Lives Matter movement and calls to reform the police, defund the police, abolish the police. Getting legislation accomplished has proved to be harder than, say, holding protests. So what can the 1850s tell us about this present moment? First of all, I guess I should have, I have to have one weak need disclaimer here about the use of history in contemporary politics, which I do think is important. I do think we can draw on the past for inspiration, analog, etc. At the same time, conditions are obviously so different today. We need to remember that before we go too deep in, we put too much weight on these historical analogies. That said, the lesson for the 1850s for me, for the left, and I say this as someone on the left, is the fusion between a moral and a material politics. If your political vision, however noble and just and, and sort of egalitarian in aspiration, is not capable of speaking also in material terms to the immediate and embodied self-interest of a majority in democratic politics, you're going to struggle. And honestly, for, again, the broader left, I don't think that this is inherently, this is an intrinsic limit on egalitarian or progressive politics, because I think there are broad popular majorities, you see them already for certain very progressive or even radical things in the context of what our political system will allow. But I think to date, the left has struggled to actually achieve that political fusion. You know, I was a big Bernie Sanders fan, and I do think he represented one of the more serious efforts to do that in the last 30 or 40 years. He actually did connect a lot of radical ideas to a mass base. It clearly wasn't enough to win the Democratic primary, and who knows whether it would have been enough to win a national election, but I think... But he succeeded in, style, in a sense. Yeah, but his style of politics absolutely connected the sort of the moral critique of, say, economic equality in the U.S. or various other forms of atrocities that mar American life, but also connected them to the self-interest of voters who want health care, who want jobs, who believe that their government can do more for them. And I think it's A, that's shaped the direction of the Democratic Party today, for one. Uh, you and Sean Wilentz have talked about that, about the return to the New Deal style. I think Bernie had something to do with that to the extent that we've seen some moves in that direction. But to achieve even more radical ends, I think the answer is, in effect, to double down on this fusion of moral and material politics. Some say it's ideological lodestar for those on the left who, who want to take activism into the world of politics. Now, to me, there's one kind of pat answer to this that says, OK, well, you now you need to grow up and you need to compromise and you need to take what you can get and, you know, move forward. There have been some sort of political commentary along those lines that says, OK, you know, that's what real politics means is sort of accepting the possible and compromising and moving on. Now, there's no question that on any given issue, Compromise is maybe necessary and politics is the art of the possible. But my view of this is a little bit different. It's actually about changing that reality. But how do you do that? How do you change those givens? Do you do it simply through a kind of outsider moral critique or do you do it through both sustained engagement in elections 
and connecting that moral critique to a populist and a materialist and a potentially majoritarian politics. Well, if I may build off my last question, on the left today, you do have activists saying abolish the police or defund the police. And to opponents of those positions, they sound the same. If timing is everything in politics, now is not the time to talk about abolishing the police. Yeah, I mean, my my view is, if again, if just to anchor it again in the 1850s, if you look at the, the consequences of Republican political victory were not moderate. They were revolutionary and bloody. And there's a very old and distinguished and now not in, in very good shape critique of the Republicans as wild-eyed lunatics who caused the Civil War. No one really seems to be arguing that anymore, but that was sort of the dominant view in this geography in the early 20th century, if you read a lot of these older books. It's not that this radicalism wasn't radical, but it was effective. And it was effective I think, because it channeled its vision for a totally transformed society in a language and through a political aspiration that presented itself as something that a majority of people could get behind. So that constraint is a constraint that I think radicals who are serious about affecting politics should take to heart. Matthew Karp of Princeton, this has been great. Good luck finishing your book about this subject, The Rise of the Republican Party in the 1850s. On the next episode of History As It Happens, congressional committees and special commissions have investigated Pearl Harbor, Watergate, the 9-11 terrorist attacks. So why not the January 6th riot? Well, we do believe there ought to be a commission to go forward. They almost assiduously avoided the words, two words that are vital to finding out what happened on January 6th, Donald Trump. Republicans chose loyalty to Donald Trump over setting up a 1-6 commission. We'll speak to a member of the 9-11 Commission about what's going on here. That's next as we report history as it happens, a podcast from The Washington Times.